um, find uh, more on the website or at our church um, realm. Those of you who are logged into realm, which is um, where we do a lot of communication within church members. Um, in your communication card, you see we're having a worship committee meeting today. That'll be in the community room. Everyone's invited. If you have any ideas, we're planning ahead. Advent and Christmas are coming soon. Um, new name tags, there's information in the narthex about that. We're going to be having a name tag Sunday one of these days and try to have some fun so we can get to know one another. Um, make or take stained glass, you can sign up for that. And new members class will be um, October 9th. So, um, the big event that's going on this weekend is Habitat for Humanity, and Edmund's going to give a little announcement about that. So if you're signed up for a habitat, you know the directions, you know the information. If there may be one or two slots available, I'm not sure if you would like to uh, to volunteer this Saturday, Dr. Edmund or Dale Ernst about um, joining us and logging in online. Yes. Um, can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, if you wanted to go to SOS, if you are a youth member and need to, you want to go to SOS, you need to know at this point we have a wait list um, because we only secured eight spots for SOS um, for in June. So we can get you on a wait list and we can push for more spots. That's not a problem. A farm, we still have time for a farm. So you know that. Um, and the other announcement is we are collecting candy for our October 30th hunger tree. We have the box up in the front, no peanuts please, no nuts in it. And if you want to decorate your car, which I know you do, we're looking for about 30 cars so that you can have a nice little party on. So hopefully you'll be behind this one, right? All right, it's time to start thinking about those car decorations. Some of the stores even have trick or treat decorations for your car. So. Pretty good. All right, we have a special prelude today from the Bell. Congregation is invited to stand for opening hymn in 858 in the Red Room.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. We look to you for your spirit of comfort and peace. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. This we pray to our Lord Jesus Christ. The people of God say, Amen. Please be seated. And we invite the children to come forward for the children's message today. And we want to just come up here for a quick message. Guess what? Your usual um, leader's not here today. So you get stuck with me. But I got a few toys up here. Let's see what I got up here. Let's see here. You need this one? What does it say on it? Yeah, this. Ash the Cliff, and it says St. Luke Lutheran Church, Ash the Cliff. <coughs> uh, that's pretty cool, huh? It's a real hard hat. <laughs> real deal, right? So, why does the pastor have a hard hat? Why do we have a hammer? Okay, Martin Luther did use a hammer. We all know that, right? You'll learn about that. He, hammered something on the church doors 500 years ago. But I'm talking about actually building something. The church building something. The church was built something. What do you think the church built? <laughs> Thinking about, well, one of the things the church built, this half came from when we built the narthex and they built the Sunday school area and they did some renovations in the church. We actually built a place to worship. Yeah. Yeah, we could build more seating. So there's things we can build within God's church and God's house. But also, Christians build things like hospitals and nursing homes and regular old houses. Do you know that? That the church often builds people houses. Why do you think the church would build people at home? Right, because God cares about everybody and everybody needs a home. So about 50 years ago, some Christians started building homes for people, and they called it Habitat for Humanity. Habitat means where you live, a place to live, and then humanity means everybody has a place to live. <laughs> And churches started working on making sure everybody had a place to live. And guess what? They build the most houses of anybody in the whole world now. Isn't that great? And we get a chance to build a house here in Memphis on Saturday. So a lot of church members are going to show up. And they're going to have their blue jeans on and their, their old clothes so they can get dirty. And they're going to be hammering siding on the house and, and painting the house and working the inside, outside, putting doors and windows up. And that's God's work. That is God's work. So Habitat for Humanity is part of God's work, making sure everybody has a place to live. Because I bet you all have a place to live, right? Yeah, so somebody made sure you have a place to live, but we want to make sure everybody has a place to live. So when you get older, you can start as a teenager at 16 years old, you can help Habitat, and we'll continue to build homes. And if you look in the hallway down across from the bathroom where the administrative wing, you'll see pictures of the house that we built. I meant to bring a picture with me, but they're on the wall. So you could, that could be a place you can look and see how many houses we've built. We've actually built more than that. We've probably built about 30 houses. But we have about 20 pictures up there, and I think that's cool. And all those families have a place to live because God's work is our hands. God has ideas for us to care for one another, but it takes you and I to do it. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we can serve you by worshiping and building places of worship, but also we can serve you by building places for people to live in, that they can be safe and comfortable to raise their children in a godly way. Watch over all your people, and may all people have a place to live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
carry that to the room. Sure. Ready? Got your seats. Ready to stay up here in front. reading is from the sixth chapter of Amos. Alas for those who are at ease in mind, and for those who feel secure on Mount Valeria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and mild young and couches, and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David improvise on instruments of music who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first to go with the exile, and the revelry of the land of your shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> we will now read responsibly Psalm 146. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my name. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they read the last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger? The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up the those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, and throughout all the time, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The second reading is from the sixth chapter of Timothy, first Timothy. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we shall be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the prince and pierce themselves with many pains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. 
He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And soon Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the cool water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in his flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, And Father, I beg you, send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, to him, even if they do not, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. As a kid, I was uh, thinking back. I was I had a nice little sheltered life as a kid, and sometimes we want to shelter our children, obviously. And so I didn't really know anything about poverty as a child growing up. I didn't see it, didn't know it existed. It wasn't in the neighborhood where I lived. But when I was about eight years old, we took a trip to New Orleans to visit some relatives. And I remember my dad wanted to walk down Canal Street. And in those days, Canal Street was full of all the big, fancy department stores and a lot of wealth. And they went in through the French Quarter. And as we walked the streets of New Orleans, I remember seeing homeless men and women. I remember seeing people in wheelchairs that were begging as we walked by on the sidewalk. I remember seeing drifters with no place to sleep, runaway teenagers, and old and fragile people begging and asking for money. On the drive back to Baton Rouge, I asked my dad why there were so many sad people on the streets. And I remember asking, how come they don't have homes? Now, my dad was a social worker. So as you might expect, he probably explained more than I need to know at eight years old. <laughs> but he explained how in Louisiana, social services weren't funded. It wasn't a priority of the government to care for people on the streets. He also explained how many people who had been in mental institutions were forced to leave, and they weren't being cared for on the streets, and how poverty and addiction can wreck families. My eyes were open to a real problem in our society, and it bothered me at eight years old, and it still bothers me today. Jesus was also bothered by poverty and the disparity between the rich and the poor. Jesus warns us more than once about the love of money in the Gospels. Last week we heard how Jesus taught a parable about a man who was fired for not making enough money for his rich boss, and how he then joined the poor farmers who were being exploited by the broken Roman economic system of the first century. Now, if all this talk about the poor seems like we're kind of piling on, it seems like every Sunday we're talking about the poor, there's a simple reason for this. We're reading the Gospel of Luke. Remember, we have a three-year cycle, and the emphasis this year is on the Gospel of Luke. And the main message of the Gospel of Luke is economic generosity and justice. Economic generosity and justice. It runs through the entire gospel, so you can't get away from it. It's baked into the text. Why? Because that's what Jesus taught, and that's what Jesus was teaching the people in his day. Remember, Jesus was poor. Jesus lived with the poor. He experienced being poor. He knew that there was this huge disparity in, in the economic system that he lived in. Jesus was born poor, he was born in a makeshift shelter in a backwoods town. Luke records Mary at the birth of Jesus singing that God fills the hungry with good things and God sends the rich away empty. Luke declares that the mission that Jesus has when Jesus gives his mission is to bring good news to the poor. That's it. That was his mission statement, to bring good news to the poor. So the rest of the gospel gives examples of Jesus doing just that. It's Luke who records Jesus saying, Blessed are you who are poor, and woe to you who are rich. 
It's Luke who says that gives the story of the rich fool who builds bigger and bigger barns only to die and not enjoy it. It's Luke who tells of a rich ruler who wants to follow Jesus, but he turns and walks away because Jesus says he was very rich and he did not want to walk away from that. It's Luke who tells the story of Zacchaeus, a rich tax collector who once he meets Jesus gives a pledge to give away half his fortune to the poor and pray reparations to any people he's defrauded. And last week we heard in, in Jesus' gospel from Luke makes it very clear that money, that what we do with our money is an indicator of our spiritual maturity. What we do with our money is an important indicator of our own spiritual maturity. So this teaching of Jesus and the poor isn't a sideshow in Luke's gospel, but rather it is a consistent and organizing theme of Jesus' teaching. Jesus was poor, and Jesus has a lot to say about the poor. In the midst of this, we have today's story, a parable of a rich man who doesn't have a name, and a poor man who's named Lazarus. And Jesus says there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And outside his gates, presumably the gates in front of his home, Lazarus lies hungry and sick. The question we probably have is, did Lazarus, did the rich man even notice Lazarus? Did he even know he was there? His world was filled with lavishness and food and parties, no doubt. Did he even know that there was a man laying outside of his gate. And also, this parable, in many ways, is more of a fable or a, it's kind of a morality tale. And quite honestly, it's a little bit heavy handed. It creates stark contrast, right, and high stakes. It implies a warning about the afterlife. But I don't think it's given us a true picture of the afterlife so much as a warning about the afterlife. It wants us to think that our actions have consequences. It wants us to think that our actions have consequences. The story is trying to wake the reader to see the needs of the poor around them, much like the rich man didn't do. So you see in the story, when the rich man dies and he's in Hades and he's being tormented, he looks up and sees Abraham with Lazarus and he tells Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and come and cool my tongue. Now the rich man obviously knew who Lazarus was and he used his name right here, right? And still, he thinks of Lazarus in patronizing contempt as a servant. The plea speaks volumes about the rich man's outlook. Not only his lack of generosity, but his clueless entitlement while he is an atheist. The very person he refused to help, he now wants to help him. After his death, the rich man wants others to come and serve him, even while he is being tormented even when he refused to help those very people when he was alive. So yes, this is a heavy-handed morality tale. And yes, today, we all struggle with homelessness in our own community right here in Memphis. We all have seen people on street corners begging. We've seen people sleeping on sidewalks and under bridges. And all of us ask, what can be done? What can we done? And that is what Jesus wants us to ask. We are right to expect that there could be some type of safety net in our very own society that all could have a place to sleep, that all could have a home. We are living in a very rich country. We like to tout ourselves as the richest, most progressive country in the world. We send rockets into space and men on the moon. We build magnificent stadiums for our entertainment. The jet set could fly to New York City and Paris just to shop for a day. But we can't provide basic housing for our own citizens. We can't provide basic health care for our own citizens. Jesus wants us to ask why. As my dad would say, it's a matter of priorities, and our government doesn't think that's a priority. But do we, as the people of God, think it's a priority? Lazarus did not have a voice. Lazarus was sick and hungry and on the sidewalk, but the rich man did have a voice, but he did not see Lazarus as a fellow human being, as a fellow child of God. 
We at St. Luke support all efforts we can to create affordable housing here in Memphis. We support Room in the Inn. We support emergency housing in churches, housing for the homeless that are coming out of hospitals, Life is Nehemiah, Nehemiah Project, housing, the hospitality hub on 2nd Street, and of course, building homes with Habitat for Humanity, making tangible efforts to alleviate this problem in our community. And our Habitat chapter is one of the largest in the United States, building more homes than most other chapters in this country. So Jesus asked us to look and to listen and to see the needs of those who are outside our gate. We may not have all the answers, but we can do our part as an advocate to be for a more just and a more equitable world. Jesus is clear. The scriptures are clear. We are to care for our fellow human beings. We are to act in their behalf. The poor should not have to wait till they die to go to heaven, to know that they're loved by God or loved by God's church. Together, we can act while we live today. We can act, we can live generous lives, we can open our eyes to see, and we can struggle with those around us to advocate for better housing, affordable housing for all people in Memphis and Shelby County. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, it is upsetting to hear that so many suffer, and Jesus clearly wanted to remind us that suffering is all around us. Lord, you have blessed us with so much, and we give thanks for the many, many blessings that we enjoy each and every day. Help us to know how to be advocates for those who need advocacy. Help us to support ministries in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities, so that all can have housing and health care and help us continue to follow the words of Jesus, to live joyful lives, to live generous lives, and to seek justice in our day. This and all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together, Change My Heart of God. <laughs> Stranger, 
tend to those who are ill, and stir us to act in the best interest of our neighbors. God of grace, enlighten our praise, inspire musicians, artists, poets, and all who create beauty in this place. We give thanks to the bell choir, parish choir, praise team, and adult choir. God of grace, pour out your spirit upon those with health concerns. Allie, Ashley, Jen, Lauren, Jean, Samantha, Kurt, Jill, Matt Jr., Eleanor, Brandy, Jay, Laura, Jin Ming, Patty A, Queen S, Lauren, Brooks, Opal, Mark, Arlene and Caridad, Jesse, Ted, George G, Larry S, Joe K, Patsy, Grace, Becky P, Charles, Joan, Maggie P, Michael, Steve, Ron, Eddie, Anikal, Elvin, Teresa, Jerry, Roberta, Julie, Jeremy, and the Trail family. God of grace. We provide comfort and guidance to family and friends of Yolanda and Larsa on her death. Bill and Sue P, Clay, Betty S, Anita, Sandra, the Brock family, Addie C, Peace in Ukraine, refugees, Kathy and Don, Shadio School, those affected by the sentence of violence plaguing our neighborhoods. Lionel lost the family on the death of his brother Maggie. Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic affected by Hurricane Fiona. God of grace. We give praise for Jody and Tyrell Witcher on the birth of their son Isaac. Marta Lopez, Lord, Josie Lopez, and the volunteers who help make our slide and yard sale a huge success. Hands on fire, Habitat for Humanity volunteers. Our chief, our end, praise team, blood cleanup team, mercy and justice team, God of grace. Yeah. Yeah. We pray now for those in need, offering our prayer silently or aloud. Give you thanks for the healthy birth Friday at Sophie and Lee, Keith and Brenna Erickson, God of grace. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of David's new job, and we also want your praise, your your presence to be known at the marriage of my grandson Anna to Tamika on Friday. Dear God of grace. Dear God of grace. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The ushers are going to come forward and pass the offering plates again. We're still practicing this after uh, years of not passing the offering plate with COVID restrictions. And then we'll have an offering for the following reception. Thank you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. <laughs> Supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and this cup, we remember our Lord's Passover death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Make us bold and merciful, God, to address you as our Father as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. You may be seated as the usher directs you forward. We invite you to come forward and receive the bread and wrap the stretched hands and then we'll take a cup of bread juice or wine and return to your seats by the side aisles. All is ready for the feast to begin.
Thank you. 